Hey everyone, uh, we are talking about repetition structures throughout the entirety of this chapter. Um, this will build upon the concepts that we talked about last chapter, so make sure that you feel comfortable with Boolean conditions and the selection structures that we focused on a whole bunch last week. Um, this video in particular is going to just cover uh, F5.1 where we talk about the basics of repetition structures. We don't actually get into implementation yet, but I wanted to focus on what repetition structures actually do before we start implementing it in Visual Basic for this video. Let's suppose that I decided to control my life using some sort of set of procedures. And as part of my getting ready procedure, which handles the waking up event for me, um, as part of all that, one of the things that I want to do is uh, put on a coat if it's pretty cold out. Um, the reason why is because I don't want to be cold all day. It would be really hard for me to get anything done if I'm just shivering and miserable and not really able to think very well. My hands are hurting from the cold and all that kind of stuff. So I want to make sure that I put on the coat so that I'm, you know, feeling pretty good for the day. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with how things can get here in the Central Coast, where you can put on a coat at 7 a.m. when it's pretty cold out. You're dressed up nice and warm and bundled up, all that kind of stuff. But by the time it reaches the afternoon, well, it's starting to get a little bit hot out, and suddenly that coat is actually too warm. And that's a problem, right? If I just try to put on the coat when I need the coat, but I don't try to, you know, stop wearing the coat at any point, I just put that coat on and leave it permanently on for the rest of the day, well, that's going to be troublesome. You know, I'm going to start getting hot, I'm going to start sweating through my clothes, uh, again, it's going to be hard to concentrate or get anything done because, well, now I'm really hot this time. So I have to have some sort of built-in mechanism in order to make sure that I do not overheat. Well, I can very easily add a built-in mechanism by just having more logic later on in my procedure where I check, hey, is it not cold anymore? If it's if it's not cold, then I can actually just take off the coat and everything should be fine. Now I am doing just great. I'm no longer overheating. I'm at a great temperature. That is assuming that we reach that part of the code where I check if it's not cold anymore at an appropriate time. But let's say I put on the coat at 7 a.m. and then I'm checking if it's not cold anymore at 9 a.m. where it still might be pretty chilly. Well, then I've taken off my coat too early, and yeah, I, I won't be hot when the time comes, but in the meantime, I'm still pretty cold. So you can't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be cold for a certain amount of time, right? Well, that's easy. I can just uh, add in more logic to check again later on, and maybe I'll catch it this time. I might not get it exactly, but I might, you know, decide to take off my coat just before it hits the perfect temperature and then I'm only mildly cold before it hits a good temperature. Or maybe I take off maybe a little too late, but I'm not super overheated at that point. So it works well enough. But then, you know, what if that third check happens at 10 a.m. and I'm still taking it off too early, right? There's all these possibilities where we can't really just account for stuff like this using just if statements because if I put my my coat on to sorry if I put my coat on at a good temperature but then I take it off too early well I, I can't just keep on inserting these checks over and over and over and over again because I'm never going to know exactly when the right time is going to be and exactly the right time when all these checks are going to run so that can be a little bit of an issue of just using this type of logic like this. Now, even worse is if I use the same getting ready procedure, but now let's say that I wake up at 1 p.m. instead of 7 a.m. 
you know, maybe my sleep schedule got really messed up. I'm waking up at 1 p.m. and I'm working late into the night, right? Well, I don't put on the coat because it's pretty hot at 1 p.m. But then I follow the same logic. You know, I'm only checking for it to not be cold anymore. So I never put the coat on. I'm never taking off the coat, right? Because the coat was never on. But then it's getting later and later into the evening. It's starting to get a little chilly again. And using the same procedure, you know, I'm I'm not going to have the uh, logic to put the coat back on if I never took the coat or if I never put the coat on in the first place, right? And, you know, maybe I solve that by having a separate procedure that that handles if I wake up when it's hot versus when I wake up when it's cold or something like that. But even then, like, I'm getting into all these different weird branches of code, all these different options, and that's all the stuff that I have to debug and all these different ways that things can go wrong. So it's a really risky way of doing things. Maybe I can try to design things so that I can predict it, but it's really tricky and maybe I just don't want to leave it up to chance like that. So maybe I should try using a different structure. See, what would be nice is if I had a logic structure, some kind of programming structure that allowed me to say, while it is cold, I should wear my coat or I will wear my coat until it is too hot rather than just saying a having a binary um, is it cold put my coat on or is it warm take my coat off all that kind of stuff rather than just having that binary structure that might even fail if it's if I'm trying to take my coat off let's say when I already have it off if the take the coat off procedure runs into an error when I never put the coat on in the first place, sort of like that later example where I woke up at 1 p.m., you know, that could be a little bit of an issue as well. So what I want to do is have some sort of structure that allows me to specify I want to wear my coat while it is cold or I want to wear my coat until it's too hot to wear the coat. Some other examples that follow this kind of logic is are, um, you know, while the traffic light is red, keep your foot on the car's brake. You don't want to take your foot off the brake while it is red because then you roll into the intersection and start causing problems. While it is red, keep your foot on the car's brake. When it is no longer true that the traffic light is red, that is when the, tra the traffic light turns green, I can take it off. So that's what this first sentence is saying. Keep my foot on the car's brake while it is red, but as soon as it stops being red, I'm good to take it off the brake and then preferably also hit the gas, but you know, we're just talking about the car's brake here. Similarly, I can say, I'm going to keep my foot on the car's brake until the light turns green. Uh, so I'm holding it there, holding it there, holding it there. I see the light gr turn green. It always turns green after it turns, uh, after it's red. Um, unless you're using one of those newer um, sort of three light pedestrian crossing lights that are still a little bit confusing to me. But assuming I'm at a regular intersection with a regular traffic light, I keep my foot on the car's brake until the light turns green. Once it turns green, I remove my foot from the brake and I go. Another set of examples. While there are still errors, debug your code. Uh, as soon as there are no more errors, you don't have to debug your code anymore. Of course, this is simplified. You should also uh, stop debugging your code if it is bedtime or you haven't eaten in a while or maybe, um, you know, you're putting in a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And at this point, partial credit will work just fine. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why, but very simplified example. In this case, I'm just saying uh, while there are still errors, debug your code. Uh, once there are no more errors, then you don't have to debug anymore because there's nothing more to fix. Similarly, I can say debug your code until there are no more errors. Or debug your code while there are still no more errors, right? So, some more relevant examples for the class there. And then one last set 
uh, calculate and display yearly interest for 17 years. So this is saying essentially um, make a new uh, year's calculation. So the first year of interest and then display that and then calculate the second year and display that, calculate the third year and display that and so on and so forth until you have calculated 17 years worth of interest for maybe some account that we can assume isn't changing in value that uh, the owner isn't putting money into or taking money out of. So for 17 years, calculate and display that year's uh, interest. It's the compound interest too. So it's um, the interest of the previous, all the previous years added in and then calculating the current year's interest based off of all of those previous years of interest. So, you know, we'll talk more about some of the financial calculations later on in this chapter. But we can also say, stop calculating yearly interest after the 17th year has passed. So we'll just keep on calculating interest, first, second, third, fourth, fifth year, et cetera, et cetera. Once we notice that we've already calculated calculated the 17th year and we're about to calculate year 18 we should say well wait this is 18 18 is greater than 17 so we already know 17 years of calculations have passed so we don't need to calculate anymore we can stop and we can move on this is the type of logic that i'm looking at in this chapter right here is this idea of repeatedly doing things or this idea of doing actions until something has occurred or while a condition is true, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what we're focusing on here. So this brings us to the repetition structure. It is a structure just like the sequence structure or selection structure. Uh, this one is actually very similar to the selection structure. Um, and you might, kind of understand why I say this as we go through the um, lessons for this chapter, but a repetition structure. It's also known as a loop because we are repeating one or more instructions using this repetition structure. Um, sort of how a selection structure had one or more instructions in a statement block that we would run uh, based on a certain condition being true. In this case, we are repeating one or more instructions. We are repeating a statement block based on the value of a condition. Now, there's a couple of ways that the condition actually can be used within a repetition structure. The first way is that we can have a repetition structure repeat one or more instructions while a condition is true. And the way this actually works is a little bit like an if then statement from our selection structures video, where there's a true path and we go down that true path if the condition is true. Now, in this case, what we're saying is we're going to go down that path, but we're going to repeatedly go down that path while the condition is true. So we enter for the first time if the condition is true, sort of, uh, we'll get to that in a sec, but we, we enter it, you know, we run through, we see if the condition is true. We run through the statement blocks. We go back, we see if the condition is true. We run through the statement blocks. We go back, we see if the condition is true. We go through the statement blocks and so on and so forth. That's uh, one of our types of repetition structures. And we call this a looping condition. I shouldn't say one of the types of repetition structures. This is one of the um, types of conditions that a repetition structure can use. But the looping condition, you can think of this as being sort of similar to a true path in the if then um, selection or statement. You know, the, the non else if then, right? Where it's just the true path, there's no false path, there's no multiple alternatives, anything like that. Now we can also have what's called a loop exit condition which says that we repeat one or more instructions until a condition is true. So we're going through the statement block and while that condition is false, we're running through the statement block over and over 
and over again. And then eventually that condition will become true. And then once that condition is true and we check it and we see, hey, this condition has evaluated to true, uh, then we actually leave our repetition structure. So this would be similar to saying, you know, if something is not true, then follow this path. So like if an if then statement had only a false path, but not a true path. Or if we just negated the condition of an if statement. Really, um, if we have two loops, one that uses a looping condition and one that uses an, a loop exit condition, uh, if the looping condition is equivalent to the negation of the loop exit condition or vice versa, then really they we can say that they're doing the same thing, uh, that they will stop running at the same time. Uh, you can transform a repetition structure with a looping condition into the equivalent of a repetition structure with an until con with a uh, loop exit condition by negating the looping conditions condition. But you know that's a whole thing. We won't necessarily worry about that just yet. Regardless, uh, we have these two types of conditions. We can either say um, repeat the instructions while the condition is true, or we can say repeat the, con the instructions uh, until the condition is true, or while the condition is false. They're, it's basically the same thing. Now we have two variants of the repetition structure as well. Uh, the, the first being the pretest loop, which I've kind of been uh, talking about the loops in terms of, you know, comparing it to an if then statement, all that kind of stuff. With the selection structure, right, we test the condition before we run the statement block. And the same thing happens with a pretest loop. You uh, put the condition at the top of the loop, which means that you um, are testing the condition first to see if you start uh, running the statements inside of the loop. And if the condition is true for a looping condition or false for a loop exit condition, then you start running the statements and then you repeat the statements over and over and over again. However, for a looping condition, if the condition is false from the get-go before the statements have even run, then you never run the statements. Similarly, if a loop's uh, condition is true and it's a loop exit condition, one of those until condition things, um, if that loop exit condition is true, then the loop is completely skipped and the statements inside are never run, similar to how an if statement works, similar to how the selection structure works. So the condition is tested before evaluating the instructions and we might not ever enter the loop. Now, the other type is the post-test loop where the condition is at the bottom of the loop, which means that you actually run all of the statement uh, block instructions first before testing the condition. So with our comparisons to an if statement, it's like if we put the statement block of an if statement, you know, we copied everything that's in there and we actually put it before the if statement and then we check that if statement condition to see if we run it again. Or if we took our pretest loop, we took all the statements in there and we copy them and we stuck them before the loop so that they run once and then we see if it loops and if it continues to run. But this is a lot cleaner of a way of doing it because we just have the loop and then we have the condition at the very bottom. So we uh, go through the loop, we run all the instructions and then we test the condition. If it's a looping condition, we uh, run all the statements again if it's true. If it's a loop exit condition, we run all the statements again if it's false. But the loop will always run at least once. Uh, it can only run once if the condition uh, is false for a looping condition or true for a loop exit condition. So it can run only once, but it always runs at least once if not more times for a post-test. So uh, pretest 
condition at top, evaluated before running instructions, may not be entered at all. Post-test, condition at bottom, tested after evaluating instructions. Uh, so those are run at least once. Uh, the loop is always entered. So I'm going to get a little bit uh, deeper into pre-test uh, loops right here. First by showing the flowcharts. So we have the looping condition on the left where we start, we initialize our variables, and then we come down to our diamond, just like we had with our selection structures. We have a diamond because we're making uh, some sort of choice. The diamond represents the choice like this, whether it's a selection structure or whether it's an um, a repetition structure. Now we have our true path, which is doing stuff. So, sort of like what we saw with the um, single selection structure, the single alternative, and the false path goes off. But in this case, the false path the false path uh, stops completely. They don't meet up. Uh, if it wasn't the end of the program, if there was stuff happening after this program, then they would. Uh, well, actually, no, they still would never meet up. The false path never meets up with, with the true path in a repetition structure. And that's probably the easiest way of telling the two apart using a flowchart. But now, in a true path, uh, as long as int num, which is initialized to 1, is less than or equal to 5, we display int num in, in our label, label nums, and then we add 1 to int num, and then we come back up here. Now, you'll notice we're adding a number to int num, which then sets it to 2, and now we're checking if 2 is less than or equal to 5. And then we'll go through the loop again because 2 is less than or equal to 5. Add 1 to int num after displaying the 2 and label nums, and we'll come back up and then check if 3 is less than or equal to 5 because now int num has 3. What's really important here, and what you always have to make sure you're doing in your repetition structures, is making sure that whatever your condition is going to be, it will eventually become true. Right here, we're guaranteeing that it will become true by adding 1 to int num. If we didn't do this, then int num would always remain at 1, which would mean that one it, we would always be checking if 1 is less than or equal to 5, which would always be true, and we're always running it, and so on and so forth. That's called an infinite loop, and we'll talk more about that in a future video. But what's important here is that we are always approaching this becoming false. We're always doing something to make this eventually become false so that this loop doesn't run forever. But yeah, the reason why we can tell that this is a repetition structure is because the true path uh, that comes back up and meets the program above the uh, condition in the case of a pretest loop. The true path always comes back up and goes to the condition, above the condition, whereas the false, the false path goes completely in a different direction. By the way, uh, this program, which we'll be referencing through the rest of the videos here, are, is essentially about uh, using Visual Basic to create an application that will display the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 next to each other in our label. So it's not replacing the label's text with the current number, but it's actually putting the, all of the numbers next to each other in the label's text. So the end result will be uh, an application that says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all next, next to each other. But that's the pretest. A loop with looping condition flowchart. For the uh, loop exit version of the pretest flowchart, it's very similar except our condition, instead of asking if int num is less than or equal to 5, it's saying is int num greater than 5. We're only trying to display the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We don't want to display 6, 7, 8, 9 or anything like that. So since we're using a loop exit condition here, um, when int num becomes six, you know, we're adding one to int num every single time. So when int num becomes six, we know that 
we want to stop. We want to get out of the loop. And actually, it's the same thing for here as well. So when indent becomes 6, for the looping condition, 6 is uh, not less than or equal to 5. So claiming that it is, is a false claim. So that's when we know to break out of the loop because this condition is false. Over here, 6 is greater than 5. So we know that this condition is true which is how we know how to break out of the loop for the loop exit condition. We know that we break out of the loop when this is true because the true path right here leads out of the loop and it goes to stop in this case or whatever other code we would have in our procedure. Now, when it's false, we do exactly the same thing. Um, display it, add one and then the path meets up above our condition, our diamond that has our condition right there. So that's the two flowcharts that we're going to use. But pre-test flowcharts can be summed up by saying, you start with a condition in the diamond, and then whichever path is going to actually go through the statement block, whether that's the true path or the false path based on the, um, looping or loop exit condition, whichever one you want to use, right? The correct path, you actually go through all of the statements in the block in your flowchart, and then at the very end, you make that path go all the way back up and meet with uh, the part of the program above the condition so that it flows back into the condition again. Uh, and then the path that needs to actually exit the loop, uh, that goes out and does its own thing and doesn't go back above to the condition again. It, it just continues on. So that's how you do the pretest flowcharts there. Now I have a um, piece of pseudocode right here for the same program. It's the pretest loop with looping condition version of that program right here. So we're declaring int num, initializing it to one, and then repeating while int num is less than or equal to five. We display int num in label nums and then add one to int num, and then we end repeat while, which signifies like, okay, this is the end of the statement block. So go back up and check the condition again. So we check the condition, go through, oh, back up, condition, go through, and so on and so forth. Uh, because this is a looping condition, then we say, Okay, as soon as this condition is false, we jump down to and repeat while, and then we go on. So of course, uh, it's a pretest loop, which means that the condition is at the top of the loop. Uh, that's the major major distinguishing factor between a pretest and a post test. It's pretest we're testing before the loop. Now, what I've actually done is I have a bit of a piece of, well, I'd call it interactive. Um, PowerPoint right here, but it's more interactive for me than it is for you because you're watching the video. But what I've done is I've actually assigned line numbers to each of the lines in this pseudocode. Uh, this is very informal, by the way, but I, I also have um, spaces where I can hold the values of int num. Uh, and then this label nums right here, I, I didn't want to take up too much space. So I, what I'm Putting in here is the last number to have been added to label nums. Uh, so it's not what label nums is currently holding because that would be all of the numbers that we've seen so far. This is just the last number that has been added to label nums. Uh, you'll see the full working version of this program in the next video, but uh, that's what that is. And then we have the number of checks, the number of times that I've actually tested the condition on line two right here. So far that's zero because we haven't started the program. That's also why label nums and int num are both empty because we haven't started the program. And then I have the next line that's going to be executed. It's the line that's going to be executed as soon as I click this step button right here. When I click this, it's going to execute the next line and then show you what all of the values are. And then I also have a handy reset button that's mostly for my own purposes. Now, when I run the first line, 
we expect int num to get the value of one because we're declaring it and initializing that value to one, right? So I click this and we get the value of one inside of int num. And we also see that the next line that's going to be executed as soon as I click this button again is going to be line two. Nothing else has happened in the program yet. We haven't checked this condition yet. We haven't uh, put anything into label nums. Uh, we've just set int num to one as part of declaring the variable. So let me click next line and we'll see what happens. So now the number of checks has turned to one. What it's done is it's checked to see if int num is less than or equal to five. Uh, is the statement one is less than or equal to five a true statement? And the answer is yes. Uh, which means because this condition is true, our next line is going to be line three, where we'll actually display int num in label nums. Now, just like that, we have put the number one into label nums. Uh, one is the last uh, number that was added into label nums. Uh, we've comp successfully done that. We'll go to line four next when I click the uh, play button. And now we've added one to int num, int num becomes two, and we're at the end of the loop which means that we'll go back up to line two so we can check the condition again as soon as I hit the play button. And we check it. Uh, we've asked is two less than or equal to five, which it is, so that is a true uh, condition right there, which means we go back into the program. Uh, we run the statement block again. So when I run line three, uh, two gets put into label nums. Remember, label nums will have the number one and then the number two. So two is just the last one added into label nums. And then we're going to run line four, which adds one to int num. Now I will uh, bounce back up to check the condition again. We check if three is less than or equal to five. It is. So the next line is going to be line three. Let me um, go through this again. So label nums now gets the number three. Uh, we add one to int num, and we're going to go back up to the top of the loop. We check again, true condition. So we've checked four times now. Uh, we're going to go back into the loop. Label nums gets four, int num gets five. Uh, we check again. True condition five is less than or equal to five. So we go through the statement block again. Um, we uh, put five into label nums and then we increase int num to six. Now int num is currently six, but notice that we're still going back up to line two. The reason why is because we still need to check that condition. The computer doesn't yet know that int num is too large. It has to actually manually check that. So it has to go back up to line two and it can check that condition. So when I run line two, it does its sixth check. It checks if six is less than or equal to five, which is not true. So this is a false condition and you can see the next line, rather than being three, like it has been before, the next line is five which means that the program is going to jump to this end repeat while it's going to skip the loop completely. And then it ends the procedure. So everything completely resets itself, but that's what happens when this is false. It jumps to line five and repeat while, and then it continues on with whatever code is below our loop. In this case, it just ends the procedure completely. So all of this stuff kind of gets reset. So now for the sake of example, let's say I made a mistake and initialized um, int num to six instead of one. And six being greater than five is going to fail this condition immediately. So let's actually see what happens. Um, when I run line one, 
we put 6 into int num. And then the next line we're going to run is line 2. It's going to check if int num is less than or equal to 5. So I'll do that. Uh, we see that we've made one checked, and it shows that 6 is less than or equal to 5 is a false statement. So our next line is going to be line 5. We're skipping the loop completely, and nothing actually is going to get put into label nums. So when I run line 5, you know, it ends, and then it ends the procedure completely, and nothing ever was put into label nums. So this statement block didn't get run whatsoever. So that's an example of what happens when the condition is false from the get-go for a looping condition pretest loop. All right, so now what I have is the pretest loop with the loop exit condition. Uh, in this case, rather than saying repeat while int num is less than or equal to 5, we're saying repeat until int num is greater than 5, and then end repeat until instead of end repeat while. Uh, that until is going to signify that we're using a loop exit condition rather than a um, looping condition. And that's actually going to be a distinction that Visual Basic makes. So make sure you feel good with that distinction. When I say while, I'm talking about a looping condition. When I say until, I'm talking about a loop exit condition. But really, uh, the behavior of this is going to be exactly the same as how it was behaving with the looping condition to split that, specifically because int num is greater than 5 is the negation of our other condition, int num is less than or equal to 5. The reason why it's important that this is the negation is because the until says that this uh, loop will run while our condition is false, and it will exit while the condition is true. Or sorry, when the condition is true. Uh, the while, however, says that it runs while the condition is true and exits while the condition is false. So really, it's uh, making this the equivalent of the negation of the while condition and then using until instead of while. Make sure that this loop does the exact same thing that the while loop does. So keep that in mind. Um, it's a good thing to use if you want to... Um, if you want to think about it as running something until the disqualifying condition is true, you can use the loop exit condition. But if you want to think about it as run while this particular qualifying condition is true, then use the looping condition. Now, I won't actually um, run through all of the values of int num and label nums and all that kind of stuff for the loop exit condition because this actually works exactly the same as the looping condition. You're welcome to um, follow along with the looping condition part of the video, but instead of checking the while condition, check this until condition if you want to verify this. But really, it will work exactly the same way. Even if I initialize it to 6, right? Um, if I check 6 is greater than 5, that's going to be true, which means that uh, the loop exit condition is true, so we just skip the loop entirely without putting anything in label nums. You can run through this yourself following what I did in the looping video. It'll be a good exercise to see if you feel comfortable with the loop logic, but you should get the exact same result if you end up doing it yourself. Alright, so now we have the post-test flowcharts, which are going to behave very similarly to the pre-test flowcharts, except the condition is at the bottom instead of the top. Which means that the statement block gets run once before we hit the condition. If you start at start, and then you go down through every statement, you'll see that you run everything in the statement block before checking to see if you repeat at all, which of course has the 
um, result of everything happening at least one time. So then at the very bottom here, you check your condition uh, for the looping condition. If it's true, you go back up to the very top of the statement block and then run through everything until you hit the condition again. If it's false, you exit the loop and in this for this program, you just stop completely. Now for the um, loop exit version of the post test loop, instead what you're doing is, you know, after you run through the statements for the first time, you check the condition. If it's false, you go back up to the top of the loops statement block and then run through everything again and hit the condition. When that condition is true, you exit and you continue on with the rest of the program, or in this case, stopping completely. So it works very similarly, except for where the condition is and where the, um, where the truth value that makes you repeat actually takes you, whether it's before the condition or before the statement block in the case of post-test loops. And here is some pseudocode uh, we have our post-test loop with looping condition. Um, the big difference here is that line two is just repeat. It signifies the top of our loop. Uh, so then it kind of gets ignored the first time around. It goes down and then they check the condition at the very bottom. We say end repeat while int num is less than or equal to five in the case of the looping condition. And then we come back up to the top. And of course I have my um, cool little toy right here where I can actually check the value of int num and label nums and the checks and the next line and all that kind of stuff as we're going through. So what I'm going to do is first run line one, which sets int num to one. And then the next line will actually be three because, you know, technically it would be two. And then we would say, okay, this just says repeat. So move on to line three. Uh, I'm kind of simplifying it right here for the sake of not having to click as much and explain things as much. So I'm just going to skip right down to three for simplicity's sake. Um, Similar thing with the pretest loop as well. Uh, I, we probably would have been hitting uh, line five a lot more and then bouncing up to two, but um, instead we're kind of simplifying things and bouncing back up to two from line four. But you know, that was the pretest loop. For the post test loop, I'm kind of skipping line two in this case and just moving straight on to line three. Now, line three. Um, we're already going straight into displaying things into label nums like this. Uh, we're not actually checking any conditions yet. And the nice thing about that is, you know, we can feel pretty confident that it will happen at least once because we're initializing it to one anyway. So we're kind of saving ourselves a check. Um, we don't have to check if one is less than or equal to five when we've already initialized it to one. Uh, you won't always have the benefit of that knowledge in your loops. Um, but when you do have that knowledge, you can take advantage of the post-test loop like this. However, let's say int num was some value set by the user. You wouldn't know for sure that that value was less than or equal to five. So you might have to use a while loop in that case, but this is a simple example. Now our next line is four, which is where we add one to int num. Uh, so we've actually gone through the entirety of the statement block. We actually go to line five in order to check our condition. Uh, and at line five, we check, we see if two is less than or equal to five is a true statement, which it is. So our next line is three. We're going to actually bounce back up to the top of the loop. I'll take this a little bit faster since you should be familiar with what's happening in the statement block. So line three, we display two in lab label nums, uh, and then we add one to int num, and then we'll do our check on line five. We check it, three is less than or equal to five. That is true. So we'll do the loop again. We go back up to line three. Uh, label nums gets three, 
it num gets four. We check. Uh, we're going to loop again. So we bounce back up to line three. Label nums gets four. It num gets five. We check. Um, we know that five is less than or equal to five, so we'll bounce back up to three. Label nums gets five. It num gets six. And then we'll do our final check. Now six less than or equal to five is a false statement, which means that we're going to end repeat. We're going to leave this um, repeat statement and go on with the rest of the code signified by this uh, pretend line six that's doing whatever. But in this case, it just ends the program. So everything gets reset just like that. So that's the difference in how it works with a post-test loop with the looping condition. Now, if I accidentally initialize int num to six instead of one, similar to the previous example uh, that we had with the pretest loop, um, what would happen is when we run line one, uh, int num gets the number six, but then we actually jump straight into the loop because it's a post test loop. So with int num being six, we actually put six into label nums, and then we add one to int num. And then we do our first check. Uh, and we see that seven is not less than or equal to five. So this is a false condition right here, which means that uh, we'll go to line six, we'll actually exit out of the loop and the um, label nums is going to be stuck displaying the number six, which is not what we wanted to do at all. We wanted to display numbers less than or equal to five. So that is a side effect of using the post test loop right here is that if we start off with an invalid input, uh, we're still going to run the statement no matter what, which might mean we have some unintended side effects. So you have to be careful about that. And of course, here is the post test loop with the loop exit condition, uh, rather than saying, and repeat while int num is less than or equal to five. I'm saying until int num is greater than five for the uh, for the same reasons that we used uh, int num is greater than five in the pretest loop with the loop exit condition. Uh, it works exactly the same way as the uh, looping condition version of this uh, post test loop, where it always happens at least once and then does the check, but it will stop running at the same time as the uh, looping condition based on how we set this condition. So that's the very beginning of repetition structures. Um, we're going to actually talk about the implementation of those rep repetition structures in the next video.